We certainly uh, apologize for the glitch that we've had for a few moments, but I think that uh, we're back online again. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We certainly apologize for that glitch that we've had just for a few moments, and I hope that uh, you're back on again. Uh, if you can see us and hear us, I would certainly like to see uh, some type of comment on the side so it indicates that uh, we're on live again. So I want you to understand, my brothers and sisters, that any time that uh, we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, it means that there is a revelation that God has given us to remind us that we are the children of God. There is a manifestation that God reveals of himself that we are the children of God. This means that we have been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been filled up with the person power of the Holy Spirit. And that means that now that sin has no longer range or rule or dominance over us. So once we take the opportunity to look at the Apostle Paul, as he writes to the church community of baptized believers, he gives us the assurance through his word, through the unction of the Spirit of God. As he writes in his journal, he lets us know that we are no longer debtors to sin. That once the eternal God resides in our heart, he is the one that directs us. He is the one that leads us and guides us. I want to read something to you, and I ask that you follow along with us very intently and allow the Word of God to percolate in your heart and in your mind. All right, the Bible says this in Romans chapter 6, verses 11 through 13, and I'm reading through uh, God's Word Bible. But prior to doing that, let me say this to you. To effectively address the two natures in the believer. Now, some will allude that there is only one nature, and some will allude that there's two natures. Now, this is something that we certainly need to follow very clearly. The struggle between these two natures explain the present conflict we experience within our members. And certainly there is a conflict. The Bible reminds us of that through the essay of the Apostle Paul that speaks to us in the book of Galatians chapter 5 and verse 17. And hopefully we'll come to that even tonight. The study or investigation that follows is a biblical template on how to have mastery over conflict in your life in sin. The key thing, my brothers and sisters, is that the eternal God has put everything at our disposal to be successful and have the mastery over internal conflicts. And keep in mind, all of us, regardless as to who you are, and how long you've been saved, how long you say that you are a Christian, a child of God, there is going to be some internal conflicts that's going to occur. The key thing is, by the grace of God and following his word emphatically, that we have the power that he has invested in us simply because we have been born again and we are believers. And not only believers, but we hear the word of God. No longer are our ears impaired by that enemy of God that seduced, deceived our federal head, Sister Eve, and certainly Adam sinned willfully. My, 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 my. So let's look at this again, if you will. So... If I'm saying that there is two natures inside of the believer, then we must understand how these natures operate. 
For the Bible tells us that we are in conflict, that they are contrary to one and the other. As we rehearse these scriptures tonight, as we investigate the two natures, I pray that you will listen and go along with me in reading and studying, but at the same time that you will be inspired to do research apart from this Bible study tonight. I'm reading once again in the God Word Bible, and I'm using the King James as well. But I'm reading of Romans, Romans, in particular chapter 6, verse 11 through 13. Note again, this is the Apostle Paul as he writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in his journal. And he sends these inspired parchments, papers, to this church that believes in this totality of Christ and that glorious gospel of good news that we can be emancipated from sin and no longer under the domination of sin dictating to us what to do. And some, certainly, and I'm going to talk about that tonight, some will say that there is the absence of a duality of natures inside of the born-again believer. And some will allude that there is simply a proclivity, a propensity, or an inclination to always be in opposition toward the eternal God. I want you to understand, my brothers and sisters, that God is able to give us strength and grace in these times of difficulty if we walk as the writer says in the spirit walk in itself it means that we have our activity our life in the spirit that he governs us we hear his voice through our spirit and because we are connected with, it, with him through spiritual birth we now follow him and there must be some resemblance of our Father in us. And that means that we yield to the Spirit, which means give right away. And we can be successful in our walk with the Lord. Let's listen to what Paul says once again in Romans chapter 6, verse 11 through 13. And I say again, the King James, and I'm sorry, the God Word Bible. So consider yourselves to be dead in sin's power. Consider yourselves to be dead in sin's power. Authority, dominance. So sin to the believer uh, has no power, has no dominance over the child of God that has been born again by the Spirit. And this certainly takes us back to the Gospel of John chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. And might I add also in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and around verse 13. So it has no power, but living for God in power, Christ Jesus gives us. Now, I want you to understand what I'm saying at this particular point. It has nothing to do with your power, my power, my intellect, being astute, being intellectually inclined. All of the power and authority is in Jesus Christ. Our strength is in him. Let me digress for a few moments. I'm reminded of the record in Jude, where it appears in the narrative that Michael and the devil, the wicked one, have a dispute over the body of Moses. And even Michael, that has extraordinary power and authority, he gives record, he says, the Lord 
rebuke thee. My God, my God. I want us to understand that we live in a day and time that folks are doing and saying anything. And that means that so often that they will say that the, I rebuke you, Satan, let's step on the devil and give the devil a black eye. I want you to understand that the only power that we have over the enemy is because that power is in us through Jesus Christ. He has the power. He has the authority. And not us. Let us continue. Therefore, never let sin rule. Never let sin rule. And if it says never let sin rule, it certainly has a connotation that we have the ability through Jesus Christ so sin does not have the rule and dominance over us as being born again believers. Never let sin rule your physical body so that you obey the desires of it. Now, when it says desires, I want you to understand that it means that there is a proclivity, there is a propensity inside of man, an inclination to do wrong. I think what happens, the novice Christian, the one beginning, the one starting this Christian race, and when they sin, when they fall short of the glory of God, in the kingdom of God, they become discouraged. It only means because they have not learned yet the Gospel of Matthew, starting around verse uh, 28 of 11. They haven't learned yet. And I want you to know that knowledge is valuable. In fact, God told Jeremiah, you know Jeremiah, that old prophet, that weeping prophet, told Jeremiah, said, I'm going to give you pastors according to my own heart, and they're going to do something peculiar. They're going to feed you. Listen to what I'm saying now. They're going to feed you with knowledge and understanding. My God, my God, my God. This means that our knowledge about God has to come from somewhere. It didn't automatically come into us because we were born again. It has to be taught. Well, Pastor Frazier, uh, every pastor doesn't have knowledge and understanding. This is true. Where does the shepherd get that? Pastor means shepherd. Where does he get that? It means that God has to feed them first. <laughs> and they're only feeding you what God has fed them. And that's knowledge and understanding. Paul says something very wonderful, I think, in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, around verse 1. And he says, follow me. As I follow Christ, he was not arrogant. He was not uh, 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 being proudful. He was just saying that I follow Christ, and he said, follow me. So, therefore, when it says that we do not have to obey sin, and I want to get to some of these things as well, because Christ is inside of us, Romans 8 around chapter 9, chapter 8, I'm sorry, Romans 8, and around verse 8 and 9. Because the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, is inside of us. And let me tell you something, my brothers and sisters, as we teach in the night. There is no place of neutrality. You are following, and something is leading you. You're not independent. <laughs> Sometimes we think we are. And that's in John chapter 8, verse 44. Jesus made a statement. It's so profound. He said, you will do the lust of your father, whatever your father desires. If we're not following Jesus, then it means that we're following the devil. That's a hard concept for many of us to masticate, which means chew, to swallow. And all of us eating at somebody's table. You think you're preparing your own food? No, that's not true. 
Bible even tells us that men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Your actions determine who you're following. Your thoughts, your emotions, your behavior. Let us proceed. The Bible uh, certainly goes on as Paul begins to write and, and conveys to us what God has given him. Never offer any part of your body to sin's power or sin's authority. And when he says that don't offer a part of that, he's telling us, in actuality, our senses. Be careful what you look at, what you see, what you smell, what you taste, what you touch. This is how the enemy that is in so many individuals. Now, keep in mind, this means the unsaved, and this means the influence that the enemy has to the born-again Christian. It's something that is very extraordinary, I think. Perhaps you may think the same. This means that the enemy, or Satan, has transformed himself in light, and it's not unusual for us to think that his ministers have done the same. Now, notice what I'm saying. If Jesus Christ has ministers that are preaching his unadulterated word, then it certainly stands a reason that the Satan or God of this world is doing the same thing or has the capability of doing that. We are transporters of his word. For the Bible tells us in John chapter 6 and verse 63 that his word is spirit and life. And if it's word is spirit in life, it means that we eat God's word. We masticate God's word. One writer declared, I esteem thy word more than my necessary food. So it's something fueling us. It's something feeding us to make us act the way that we do. How many times you prayed and said, Lord, your will be done. Because it's either God's will that is operating in you or it is the will of the enemy that is operating in you. If you have not been born again, then it means that you are under the auspices of the enemy. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3. The children, the spirit of disobedience. It's either the Spirit of God that's working inside of you or it's the Spirit of the enemy. All right, I'm going a little further. Instead, offer yourselves to God as people who have come back from death. That's Ephesians chapter 1. I'm sorry, 2 and 1. Come back from death. And this is, this is what baptism does as well. And are now, are now alive. Now alive. And I'm alive in Christ. Offer all your parts or your members of your body to God. Using them to do everything that God approves of. And oh, my brother and sister, this is not automatic. It takes some time, takes some time, takes some time. The Bible tells us, he that thinketh he stand, take heed, lest he fall. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Effectively addresses the two natures in the believer. And I'm going over some of this, so just be patient with me this evening, if you will. Now, we first of all must understand that there is a nature that is in mankind. There is a natural propensity, proclivity, inclination to do wrong. It's in all of us. I don't care how long you've been on this earth. It's in all of us. Well, Pastor Fraser, what about those folks that... Uh, do good, they're charitable, they're benevolent. 
You know what Paul said about that? Paul says his righteousness is as filthy rags. My, my, my. Now keep in mind, if his righteousness is as filthy rags, I want you to know that mine was and yours was as well. The fallen nature acquired. Where did it come from? Who gave it to us? Why do we act the way that we do? Why is the world in the shape that it's in? Have you ever asked those questions to yourself? Have you ever pondered some of these significant things in your mind? Why am I here? What purpose do I have on planet Earth? Why do I think the thoughts that I think? Why did automatic thoughts run through my mind? Oh, can I talk with you this evening? Why are some of the thoughts perverted? And why are some of the thoughts godly? Hmm? And of course, some of you may point the finger and say, Pastor Frazier, oh my, that's all right with me. Yet you are a child of God. And once you come to the place to be honest with you, yourself, then God can get, begin to help you. I gave reference the other day talking to someone, and I made the statement, how in the world can you get a positive response when somebody asks you for help or advice and they give you a hypothetical narrative? Well, you have to give a hypothetical response. But oh, when we open our heart and not afraid to self-disclose, not afraid to be vulnerable, then God can help us. But a whole lot of Christians, and let me say that again, Christians have not come to that place in their journey, their walk with God. And yet at the same time, we are fooled, self-deceived, because God knows everything about us that can be possibly known. And even those secret things, those presumptuous things, and nothing is hid from God. Even the night is as day before our Creator, the eternal God. Oh, hallelujah. He's always there. He is omnipresent. Oh, check out Psalms 139. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's proceed. What does the Bible say about our sinful nature? And if any time we want to get valid information, we need to go to the Bible. Now, not only we need to go to the Bible, that's the first step, but we need to seek the mind of the Lord because these things are only spiritually discerned. And we try to put our own tent on them. And many times we miss what the eternal God is trying to say uh, to, to us. Those who live according to the sinful nature. Now hear what I'm saying, that sinful nature. I'd like to say it like this so it really hits us. That old you. My, 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 that old you, prior to being born again. That sinful nature, and what comes natural. It's natural for a bird to fly. It's natural for a fish to swim. And what happens is that bird, under any circumstance, catch the bird. The bird's in your hand. The bird starts moving, moving very abruptly and the first thing comes to your psyche and the mere, mere fact that you think the bird is trying to escape I give you that but in actuality the bird is only doing what it naturally does the bird is trying to spread its wings the bird is trying to fly those of you that fish and when I say fish I'm talking about catching some fish not just going fishing <laughs> I've got some friends of mine, we, we fish and sometimes we're successful and sometimes 
We're not. You know who you are. But let's go back to our subject. Certainly, I think we had consensus this evening to say that fish swim. It's their nature. It's what they do naturally. Catch the fish, you bring them out of the water on your rod and reel. <laughs> and you see, you see them wiggling like this, right? I want you to know that the fish is simply trying to swim. <laughs> He's just in a new environment. And those of you that would catch the fish and you didn't have some place to put him or a stringer, et cetera, et cetera, but you would take the fish and you'd throw the fish on the bank. And the old fish was doing it like this. You said, oh, my, the fish is flopping. The fish is trying to get away. No. The fish is in a new environment. And the fish is simply doing what is in its nature. And that's trying to swim. I say that to say this, that when you have a sinful nature, that nature is always turning towards sin. It's in opposition toward God. And there's a whole category of those things that the sinful nature does. And that, once again, is in Galatians chapter 5, and you can start with verse 13 and come right on down to 16. It's also found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 as well. I take opportunity to read those particular scriptures at your leisure. So therefore, it is the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. Now, it means the mind. Something uh, Jeremiah says, again, I want to bring it to your attention, and I would certainly encourage you to uh, search it out in its entirety and ask God to give you a understanding of that particular passage of Scripture. Jeremiah says this. He says that the heart is deceitful above all things, and it is desperately wicked. One writer says the mind, those things that are in the soul of man, the mind, the heart, ah, his personality, his character. And I'm certainly under the persuasion to accept what the writer is trying to convey. And mind you, he's talking about that unconverted, that sinful heart, that corrupt heart that God has promised to change. And that body will trans is a tr method of transportation to carry out those desires that they're manifest in your body or in the world or in this environment. And ironically, because many of us do not study, do not search, the Bible tells us to do so, search the scripture. That we fail to understand that many times we think it's our desire, but if you note something, the Bible says that the desire of your father you will do. Did you know that Jesus Christ himself in his earthly ministry simply done the desires of God? And that ought to be us, that his desire is manifest in us. And if not, Satan desire is manifest in us. No, you're not a separate entity. And once again, there's no place of neutrality. This means, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. All right. According to the Spirit, have their minds set on what? the spirit desires the sinful mind is hostile hostile you know what I'm saying man? the sinful mind is hostile that one that has not been born again it's hostile to God one writer says it's not subject and neither indeed can be this also depicts that sinful nature that is in lost humanity. 
regardless of whether you want to accept that or not, I'm reading the scripture, and it's according to God's word that we say some of these things without reservation. It means that that person that is in the flesh, they will always do fleshly things. And fleshly things, in its simplicity, it means worldly things, the things that you think that you want to do. <laughs> my, 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 my. And have no con idea that these things are influenced in the flesh by the enemy. Because Satan himself is in opposition toward God and his children are as well. Those that lie, well, that's what the father does. He's a liar. Those that murder, that's what the father does. And because they are Satan's children, they will do the desire of their father. My, my, my. So that stands a reason. If you are the children of God, you should do and follow the desires of the Lord. It does not submit to God's law or God's, God's rule, God's authority. And the Bible says, nor can it do so. It just can't. It just can't. Until God's Spirit comes inside of us and makes his abode, his resident, he abides in us. We can never hear what I'm saying. This is an absolute. We can never please the Lord. And because we have this proclivity, this propensity, this inclination inside of us, this is why that we have to constantly be on guard and understand how our body functions as a child of God. You can be successful in your walk with God every day. My, my, my. And I know that there are some that will debate with me. You mean to tell me, Bishop Frazier, we can be happy every day? We can do the right thing every day? I believe so. I believe so. And he is the one that is able to assist us and guide us. Something else I want to interject as we go along here, and maybe I should hold it for a little later. The child of God that has been born again and has the Spirit of God that is operating inside of them. This means that you are walking in the Spirit. What does it mean walking in the Spirit? It only means that you're living by the Word of God. Walking in the Spirit. Bible tells us once again in John 6 and 63 that this means that his word is spirit and life and this also means that Jesus said that men shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God so we know emphatically that we're in his will following his desire when we obey his word. Note Jesus made a statement in his earthly ministry and said this, and I think it speaks volumes. If ye love me, <laughs> and this is the determining factor, if ye love me, he says, keep my commandment or keep my word. My, my, my. If you have fidelity, my God, my God. And he made a profound statement and said, Why call me Lord, Lord, 
and do not the things that I say. Oh, it takes us a lifetime to work on us and not work on everybody else. Bishop uh, Williams in Anderson, Indiana, said something that was so striking to me on one occasion. He said, Frazier, he said, I tell God, Lord, save me, work on me. And I've adopted that for myself as well. Lord, I'm the one need to be worked on. I'm the one need to be saved. My thoughts, my emotions, my behavior. And oh, what a wonderful thing to say. But so often we are so very critical to other individuals. We lose that spirit of Christ and having empathy toward individuals. that are not where we are and where we're supposed to be. Lord, his, Bishop Williams would say, Lord, save me from me. And I, oh, I think that's a profound statement that all of us should adopt. Lord, save me from me. Why? Because we are our biggest enemy. Yes, I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you. You. Yes, I'm talking about you. You know, when I'm pointing my finger right now, I'm pointing at me as well. Oh, hallelujah. I made a statement here at Bethany. I said it before. I'll say it again. And I'm, I'm in the ballpark. I tell folks sometimes, raise your hand if Jesus Christ is your Savior. And they raise their hand. And I make the statement. I said, well, then he's saving you from something. And some folks won't even raise their hand. But that's them and the Lord. <laughs> then I make the statement. I said, let us understand that Jesus Christ is master. And if he's your master, then you obviously are masterpiece. And some will not raise their hand again. So I conclude that you are a masterpiece in the works. This means, my brother and sister, that we have a job. The job so often is not directed at someone else, it's directed at us personally. To be knowledgeable of what we have to contend with. Some will say that there is no such thing as original sin. And I certainly will not uh, simply attack what uh, Edward says or what... Uh, the Armenian idea of original sin. Now, when I say original sin, it takes our mind back to the Garden of Eden. Oh, my, my, my. That paradise, that place where all of us are trying to get to, that utopia. The place where it seemingly everything was in its proper perspective. There was no want just to walk with God. What is original sin? And that's something, maybe something that ponders in our head, our mind. And uh, I would certainly allow you, ask you allow it to percolate in your heart and mind as well. Oh, hallelujah. It's a doctrine. It's a teaching. It's a dogma of the church. And many are still wrestling with the thought now as they did in the second and third century. It says that everyone, now hear what I'm saying, I want you to get this, that everyone is born sinful. And as we go along in this study, I, I want you to begin to make some conclusions when you hear certain things. And also, red flags ought to go up. So original sin or the doctrine or the dogma in its simplicity, in its simplicity, very simplest form, is the idea 
that says that everyone is born sinful. Now, I, I want to clarify with what Bishop Fraser is saying. And I'm saying cer certain things tonight to stimulate your psyche or your thinking, your reasoning. And so many times the enemy attacks our thoughts. And many times they are irrational. But I'm talking in terms of you beginning to look at the Word of God from the spiritual rationale. And to know something for yourself. Knowledge is powerful. Even the Bible said, if my, my God, my God, my people are destroyed for the lack, the deficiency of knowledge. It's not the knowledge that you're trying to impress somebody, but the knowledge that enables you to walk with God and stand firmly on God's word. Not based on some illusion, but firmly on God's word. That says that everyone is born sinful. Now follow what I'm saying, if you will. This means that they are born with a built-in urge to do bad things. This is a proclivity, a propensity, an inclination. And to obey or disobey God. It is an important doctrine. Now, one of the key things that one must consider as a student of the Bible. I must do research. I must investigate to see whether or not these things are true. Because the saying that I have, wrong information, wrong destination. The Bible typifies a group of individuals that were called Brians in the book of Acts. They did not exclude, they did not give themselves to refudiate, rebuff, but they searched the scripture to see whether or not what was said was true. And how often we need to search, we need to investigate very diligently, and certainly by the unction of the Spirit of God, that he leads us and guides us. No, we don't have it all. Oh, I've been in bed sleep and concerned about something in Scripture that I, I could not and did not understand. And the eternal God would just wake me up and just give it to me. And I tell you what, I'd laugh and I'd say, oh, Lord, I got it. I got it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> now, I'm talking about my relationship with the Lord. And I love his word. I'll read something. I say, oh, my Lord, that, that is something. Oh, hallelujah. I said, it's powerful. And what the Lord does, he wants to speak to your heart. Because you're a son, you're a daughter. And you ought to want to speak to him as well. So it's important for us to understand this. Now, when I say born, and I say they're born with a proclivity, a propensity, an inclination to sin. And if you don't understand those particular words, take opportunity to get you a good dictionary and check it out. Proclivity, propensity, and inclination. These are important words for us to understand this doctrine, dogma of original sin. Could we 
perhaps say that a sinner is one that sins. Well, let's further expand this illustration as we look at this with a fine tool I and mine. But I say a man is a painter. By hearing the word painter, it certainly indicates that he has painted something. Whether it's perfected, profound, or whether it's elementary. If I would say a man is a race car driver, it would certainly indicate that he is driving some type of vehicle and that he perhaps is racing. If I say a man is a pilot, and that let not me be accused of being gender bias. If she's a pilot, it would certainly indicate that she is piloting some air vehicle. So if you say a man is born a sinner, I'm just opening this up tonight. Born to sinner does not it indicate that uh, the person has to sin? I would certainly think that we'd have consensus to say this is true, or at least it's plausible. Let's let's proceed. I hope I'm I'm putting something. Uh, on on the table. So, in our thought of original sin, the question then must be presented to us, are all of us born sinners? Let me say that again. You Bible students, are all of us born sinners? If I would say that a person is born to be a painter, born to be a race car driver, born to be a pilot, and what I'm saying, born to be, I want you to listen to what I'm saying. Babies, are they sinners? Are babies sinners? And someone would say, well, what actually is sin? Let me put this in your mind, too, as we study tonight and as we go along. And I want you really to hear what Bishop Frazier is saying. And as we take opportunity to allow the Word of God to percolate in our heart and our mind and all these particular things, we all love the Word of God. And when we make absolutes, perhaps red flags ought to go up. Babies are born sinners. Well, let me say this and uh, to stimulate your heart and your mind to do some research and study. If we were on a telecast, we'd make a commercial right now <laughs> and say we'll come back because we're almost at the end of our study tonight. I want to leave this with you, though, and I'll pick this up uh, next Bible study. So I'm giving you way in advance to do some personal research. Babies are not born sinners. Now the question is, are they or are they not? This is what you have to research. You'll have to do. No person 
is a sinner until he or she violates God's spiritual law. Uh oh. Well, is a fisherman a fisherman? Oh, once again, fisher lady, fisher woman, until they catch any fish. Is a painter a painter until they paint? Is it a pilot a pilot until they fly? Is a race carver, race driver rather, a race driver until they get in the automobile and race it? Babies do not have the capacity to commit sin. I gave you a category and I called Galatians chapter 5 verses 13 through 19 and starting with 19 in particular going to verse 21. That is a category of sins of the flesh. Logic and common sense, and I don't know why they call it common, dictate that the idea of original sin, hear what I'm saying now, might be contrary to the very nature and character of God's word. Oh my, yes, I've said something there. And you know what? I'm going to leave it right there for next time. And I want you to take opportunity, if you will, if this stimulates you, if it touches you. Do some research. My brothers and sisters, and next time we'll get into this a little more in depth. Pastor Frazier, are you saying, no, I'm teaching? And teaching certainly means that if you are learning, that you'll be stimulated enough to do some research. If you were in the classroom, I would say this is your assignment for next Tuesday afternoon at 6 o'clock. Let me give you a verse to study as well. And that verse is 1 John 3 and 4. 1 John 3 and 4. Well, my brothers and sisters, my time has certainly come to its conclusion tonight. And I'll stop here. And we'll pick up on that by the grace and will of God next Tuesday afternoon. And I hope you tune in to us as well. This is Bishop G.W. Frazier, Sr., coming from Bethany Apostolic Church in the heart of the city of Evansville, Indiana. We're located at 212 Mulberry. Yes, at this time, God has blessed us. We're having service at 11 a.m. on Sunday morning. We are here about maybe a couple of hours. Yes, we are practicing social distancing as well. It's according, according to the CDC and according to our governor of the state of Indiana. I certainly make it compulsory that all of us wear masks here and social spacing as well. When you come, you'll see on our front porch, no mass, no service. And of course, you see the bottom where it says, I am my brother's keeper. We have a protocol, a strategy that we follow. And by the grace of God, we've been successful so far. We're not boasting because we 
would not tempt the Lord our God. If you come, we want you to feel safe by the safeguards that we have implemented. And also, we want you to be free to feel the presence of the eternal God and that you come with a mindset of praise and worship. I think that there is nothing like sanctuary worship and we give our hearts to the Lord. And keep in mind, with all of our members, this is voluntary. Be it according to your faith. And certainly to those that have pre-existing health problems. Stay home. Watch us on Facebook and YouTube. But while we're here, and our hands go up, we're thinking about you. Before we leave tonight, I want you to know that we have a food pantry that is open here at Bethany, 212 Mulberry, on the first Monday and the third Monday of each month from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. We try to service our community to give some back. And keep in mind that is from 6 to 8 p.m., first Monday and first first Monday and the third Monday of each month. While you are there listening, if you want to get in contact with us, that is Bethany Apostolic 212.org. Once again, that's Bethany Apostolic 212.org. Our email is bethanyapostolic212 at gmail.com. We love you. We're praying for you. So many have lost their lives, and we pray that God would comfort them. So many are in our hospitals, and we pray that God will heal them, give them an extension. So many are overwhelmed, and so many are fearful and not knowing what they do. I often say our government is in chaos and so many hurting folks all around the world. And even though this vaccine is coming, stay strong, be vigilant, do those things that are necessary to keep yourself healthy and those around you. If you're at a place right now that you can bow your head or raise your hand, let's just pray together. Father, we thank you today, today, for blessing us, keeping us. Thank you, Lord God, for keeping our mind in a troubled and confused world stayed on you. Thank you, Lord God, for protecting us and our children, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In our times of weakness, in our times of adversity, Help us, Lord God, to cast all of our cares upon you, knowing that you care for us. Lord, and help us to embrace your word. You promise that you would never leave us nor forsake us. I pray, O oh God, for those family members that have lost loved ones, comfort their heart. I pray, O oh God, for those that are sick with this virus, give healing. And I pray, O oh God, in the name of Jesus, those hearts and those souls, oh God, that are just hurting and don't know what to do. I pray for those, Lord, that are hungry. And Lord, more importantly, I pray for the lost. I pray for the backslidden. I pray for the apostate. I pray, oh God, save us. Bring us out of this chaos. Bring us through this time, Lord God, of crises. Help us to depend upon you. Help us to love one another. Oh, Lord, watch over, strengthen us, keep us according to your will, according to your purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Until next time, my brothers and sisters, be encouraged. This is Bishop G.W. Frazier, Sr., coming to you from Bethany Apostolic Church in the heart of the city of Evansville, Indiana. I encourage you 
to keep the faith.